Hi folks, uh, this is uh, Richard here from uh, Stonehenge Aotearoa and uh, we'll be looking at the night sky. Now, let's bring uh, the night sky itself up and uh, I always like to thank Dan Browson uh, who supports this program and I thought to start by looking at some of the basic things that human beings have learned over a while. You know, I think these days, because we live in a world of technology, we tend to forget what life would be like without it, you know. Um, but once upon a time, we had to learn things. I, I always remember when I, my love of the countryside came from my gran, she lived out in the, out in the countries, and they grew most of their own food. And if the, uh, one of us kids got hurt, well, gran would go out into the garden, and she'd get a herb and rub it on the wound, it all worked. Um, Trouble is, uh, these days we've forgotten all this knowledge, this information that we had. But it's navigation, uh, healing and so on. We rely upon all the technology and, and things around us. And one of the important things that we have at Stonehenge Aotearoa is really is all about relearning the ancient technology, the knowledge of our ancestors, which actually brought... Um, civilization itself into being. Now at the centre of Stonehenge is an object called the obelisk and it's a great big tall thing and those of you watching on TV will be able to see that now, a tall pillar. And the obelisk to the Egyptians had a lot of obelisks and uh, they said that they were a petrified solar ray. Right? But the whole purpose of the obelisk is to cast a shadow. And what people often become uh, uh, amazed at is that just by looking at a shadow cast by an object on the ground and so on, you can work out the date, the length of the day, which varies throughout the year, where the sun is amongst the stars, a whole variety of different objects and so on. And our obelisk has got um, lots and lots of other features with it as well. Now, when you come up to the obelisk, what you discover, it's got a hole. And there's actually, if you stand at a certain point and you look, so you can look through the hole, so it's a perfect circle, and you look up into the sky, the spot in the sky that you're looking at marks what we call the South Celestial Pole. You can do that either through the hole or along the top cap. Right. Now, that's, that marks out the South Celestial Pole, and that's the point in the heavens around which the, everything appears to rotate. So for those of you on TV now, you can see a, a long exposure photograph of the obelisk and you can see the, the stars drawing trails. And of course, as they do so, they draw lines and everything appears to be circulating around that spot. Now, of course, the first impression one got, and obviously what our ancestors had thousands of years ago, is that the, the entire sky was rotating. But of course, it's not rotating. What's actually rotating is the Earth. And that spot that south celestial pole is actually the earth's axis projected into space uh, but the interesting thing about it is always a number of degrees above the horizon equal to the latitude at which you're standing so if you were standing at the south pole that spot where everything is rotating around would be directly overhead it will be 90 degrees above the horizon you would be standing at latitude 90. Here at Stonehenge, if you measure the angle between the, the South Celestial Pole and the horizon, you find it's 41 degrees. That's the latitude we're standing at the moment. But not only that, first of all, you can work out your latitude, but also once you've found the South Celestial Pole, that you know that you're, work, you're looking absolutely due south. All right? And that, of course, gives you all the other coordinates. Behind you is due north, and then, of course, you've got east and west at right angles to that. All right? So with the obelisk, just by looking at the, finding the south celestial pole, you can work out all your coordinates and your latitude, all the prime things that you need for navigation. OK, what, how do we find the south celestial pole? If you didn't have an obelisk and you were on a ship, well, I've just taken you back for those of you watching us on TV. And you're looking at a night sky you simply won't see from, uh, uh, from New Zealand. We're looking at the night sky from the Northern Hemisphere. And uh, I can remember when I was a kid, but looking at the night sky, learning and picking out the Big Dipper. All right, it's actually part of the, the Great Bear in the sky. Well, we call it the Great Dipper because it looks like a plough as it goes around the sky. And two of the stars on the Dipper point to the 
another star, Polaris. This is the North Star. And just about anybody who's read a book will have heard about the North Star. And the reason why it's so important is Polaris sits almost absolutely flat back on the North Celestial Pole. So during an evening when all the other stars are rotate, are moving around, Polaris stays motionless. And I can remember, as I say, back as a kid, learning to how to find Polaris. And those, as the other stars, the Big Dipper moves in a big circle around the, uh, the, the Polaris, those lines, stars always line up, so you can always use the plough to find the Big Dipper. So Polaris is a nice big bright star, and it marks exactly where um, due north is, and it marks out what your latitude is. But of course, once you pass the equator, travel over the equator, you can't see the North Star anymore. And the navigators had to use the South Celestial Pole. But unfortunately, there's no bright stars in the, like anything like Polaris in the South Celestial Pole. And once we fade the light down, after sunset, we'll see the stars come out. And then we're going to see almost overhead in the early evening, around about six o'clock, one of the most famous of all, perhaps the most famous constellations in the Southern Hemisphere, the Southern Cross, all right? And there it is there, up in the sky, almost directly overhead. Now, there are other crosses in the, in the Southern sky. There is the, um, the False Cross and the Diamond Cross and so on. The way in which you pick out the Southern Cross is the two bright stars that follow it around the sky. Now, these are called the two pointers and they point to the Southern Cross. Now, the reason why the Southern Cross is so well known is because if you know and you're familiar with the Southern Cross, you can find use the Southern Cross to locate that potent spot in the sky. In fact, originally, the Southern Cross used to be part of another constellation, and navigators took these bright stars away and formed the smallest constellation in the sky, the Southern Cross, what we know often call Crux, uh, because you can use it to find the South Celestial Pole. Now, if you draw a line through the long axis of the cross, right, you come to another bright star. And this is Achenar, right? And Achenar also is a nice big bright star and it rotates around it. Now, roughly midway between the two, between Achenar and the cross, is the South Celestial Pole, right? And you might think, oh, well, there's, you've got to do this with the eyes, but you're amazing how, how good the human eye is. If you look up there, you look at crutch, you can pick out, oh, that's south there. That's the South Celestial Pole, and that's due south. Just by finding crux, the Achenai, and the Achenai is easier to pick up because it's the only bright star in that region of the sky. <clears throat> so there's your big compass in the sky. All right. Now, of course, what's happening is the, all the stars are rotating around the South Celestial Pole, as seen from Earth, right? So that gives us due south, is directly underneath it. And then as we move around the sky, over a 24 hour period, the entire sky will appear to rotate around that spot. We won't see all of these stars all the time, of course, because sometimes it's going to be in the daytime, but it's going to change for over the year, all right? So, there's the central spot around the, which the entire sky appears to rotate. All right. So that's where, the, for those of you watching this on TV, right now, if you go out about six o'clock in the evening, the Southern Cross is going to be virtually its highest point in the sky. Achenar's down near its lowest, and that's where, where it's going to be. By midnight, six hours later, the sky will have rotated around. Now, the Southern Cross will lay on its side. But once again, no matter what, what so long as the sky is clear from here in New Zealand, you can see the Southern Cross and you can see Achenar. So anytime the sky is clear, you can use those uh, stars to uh, find the South Celestial Pole. And that, of course, gives you absolute due south. And from that, you can also work out your latitude. So that is the importance of the Southern Cross and why you see it on so many flags and so many emblems. It was the star that was used to get people here. Anyway, folks, we're going to have a short break now and we're going to listen to a piece of music written by Jim Wormsey. Jim used to walk with me for many years when I was in Wellington uh, making planetarium shows. He's a musician but also writes music. So, And he's written this little piece of music for me here called Galaxy Rise. And so we're going to listen to that now.
OK, folks, so we're back with Richard on the night sky. But I thought I'd start off, we were just talking a little bit earlier about finding your way around the heavens. And a lot of people wonder when you talk about working out your uh, latitude and trying to work out the number of degrees the south, the south celestial pole is above the horizon. Well, um, how did they do it? They didn't have theodolites and things like that. Well, we know from the Smiley tales and so on, what they used was the most complicated piece of machinery known to us to this day the human body. You see, irrespective of our size, our bodies tend to be built in proportion. And when I hold my arm out like this at full length, right, and come around like that, okay, uh, now when I spread my fingers out, from my eyes, from the top of my thumb to my little finger, right, that is 20 degrees. Now if I was a much bigger man, I'd have a bigger hand, but my arm would be longer. My outstretched hand will still cover 20 degrees, all right? Now if I go across the knuckles, looking across my knuckles, well, that's, uh, we're, we're looking out at 10 degrees, all right? The thumb, two degrees. The little finger, one degree. And so the navigator would stand on the side of the ship work out where the Southern Cross was and Akinar was, and then once he'd worked out where the South Celestial Pole, he'd just used a hand to climb down the stars to work out his latitude. And once you're able to do that, that's a basic knowledge you needed to sail across the entire Pacific. Anyway, having started talking about um, the Southern Cross, I thought we'd stay on that and uh, let's have a little bit closer look at the Southern Cross. So that's how it's going to appear tonight, around about six o'clock in the evening. Let's have a close-up look, sort of thing we'd see through a large telescope or camera. And there's the Southern Cross right smack bang at the centre, for those of you watching on, on TV. All right. Now, what is very noticeable and quite close to the, the Southern Cross, because Southern Cross is embedded in the Milky Way, is what is known is as a big black patch, patch. With the picture that you're seeing on uh, the screen on TV, you're seeing a lot more stars than can be seen with the unaided eye. This is the sort of thing you can see with a telescope. But this coal sack, this dark area, can be seen there. And actually, it's, it's very noticeable. It's actually used as a uh, navigational beacon uh, by Polynesians. All right? uh, the coal sack and its distance is actually a, a gigantic black cloud of dust, gas and ice crystals located about 400 light years away. And this cloud is enormous. It covers huge numbers of light years across. And this material which you find, these black clouds along the track of the Milky Way, are the raw material from which new stars are formed. And when stars are formed, they don't just form on their own. They always form in clusters. So if you look along the Milky Way with a pair of binoculars, and that's of course where the stars are formed along the plane of the Milky Way, you find all these beautiful star clusters. And there's one that's right smack bang in the Southern Cross. Right? And you can just pick it up with the unaided eye. There it is there, uh, next to this, and it's called the Jewel Box. Let's have a look at it, you know, see how magnificent it is, for those who got it on TV. Now the Jewel Box cluster contains about 50 stars. With a popular, uh, with a pair of binoculars, you can probably see half a dozen stars. And its distance is 7,600 light years. Now, I want you to bear this in mind, 7,600 light years, all right? Well, that means we're seeing it as it was 7,600 years ago. And you can see that all those stars, they're all part of the cluster, their central region, but they're all very in brightness, which they do. The most notable one that you pick, the eye picks up is the red one at the centre. But they're all giant stars, far, far more luminous than the sun. If the sun was in that picture, it'd be one of the little tiny fainter stars at the background there. Now, it's not. this is not that the sun's a, a feeble star or anything like that. This is all down to the fact that uh, <coughs> The big bright stars stand out over the uh, light years, while the little fainter, the common garden variety of stars, doesn't. All right, a bit, a bit the same when you look across a paddock. You can see the, you see the bulls and the cows and the sheep, but you don't see the millions of insects that are there as well. All right, so that's the jewel box cluster, and if you get an opportunity, have a look through that at the telescope. It's absolutely magnificent. All right, so they're baby stars. Okay, now the, the big, the brightest star, which is at the point of the cross, is named. Acrux, and its distance is 320 light years away. 
it just looks like a star to us but when we look and we test things out through telescopes what we find is unlike our sun is what we call a binary star two stars orbiting around each other right so if you lived out there you'd have two suns but it wouldn't be very pleasant because these two stars are tremendously hot and bright in fact the total amount of energy being pumped out from these stars is 25,000 times that of the uh, sun so even somewhere like Pluto would be molten just about due to the heat of these stars so that and <coughs> they're 320 light years away and the two blue stars luminosity 25,000 times so you can see that these are rather unusual stars the second brightest star which is next the one that's next to the the beautiful cluster is Mimosa all right now Mimosa is 350 light years away and it too is a, a blue giant star but this one is just a single one rotating very rapidly shedding matter this star is 34,000 times brighter than the sun you see when a star cluster is formed the very first stars are, not, are formed are not little stars like our sun they are these gigantic blue stars and the, the radiation pressure from these stars squeezes the gas around it and there in that gas then the it begins to collapse under gravity and the smaller stars are formed so the second one is mimosa now the third brightest one is Gecrux, and that's notable because as you will see it on tv and certainly you can notice it if you're looking at it through a telescope is that it's not bluish white as the, the other ones are it's a sort of orangey red color all right and indeed this star is a what we call a red giant it's a star that's already gone used up all its hydrogen fuel and is expanding so getting towards the end of its life uh, it's just, it's only 88 light years away i say only 88 compared with the other ones it's it's small and it's 1500 times brighter than the sun and it's really good crux is very much like what the sun our sun's going to look like in about five billion years from now because it too one day will turn into a red giant okay and then after that we've got delta crucis right the faintest it's the most distant of them it's 460 light years away and what we've got here is another blue giant star uh, this one is 460 light years away and it's 2100 times brighter than the sun so equal to 2100 suns so you can see that all those big bright stars of the um across are all very very important but indeed they're not going to last very long we're not in cosmic terms in a few millions of years from now they will burn themselves out all right and looking around uh one final thing i want to point out is just as you find there's a, a bright patch in the sky there's a bright patch in the sky and this is the eta corona nebula and embedded in the center of that this is nine thousand light years away is one of the if not the brightest star in the galaxy it's four million times brighter than the sun all right anyway folks that's the sky that you can see at the moment uh, so keep an eye on that spot when that that star is going to explode anytime soon and when it does so it's going to turn the night sky into broad daylight all we've got to do is hope that nine thousand light years is far enough away finally folks Stonehenge is open um, at the moment on weekends and school and public holidays from 10 o'clock to 4 p.m. You can take treks around it. We've got exhibitions on Mars and the planets and we also do guided tours. But I should point out to you that um, we've got uh, star safaris on Friday and Saturday evenings. And finally, we've got the winter solstice coming up and that's this Saturday, June the 19th at 4.15, the tales and legends of the winter solstice. So if you want to look, come, learn about some of this magic, come along then. With that, folks, I'll cut off and catch you in a couple of weeks.